Well, as I said earlier, evidently I'm not Pastor Moses, and this is going to be kind of a different night. Uh, maybe it's going to be a little retro, I don't know, but uh, I'm old, and I'm old-fashioned, so I don't, know, don't do all this technology too well, but uh, I wanted to share with you what God's put on my heart tonight, and I need to give you a little backstory about why we're into this particular verse that we're going to be in. The first time I ever used this text, I was preaching in view of being called as a pastor of a church. That was my second sermon I ever preached. And I used this text the second time when I entered the pulpit of that church for the, to preach the 1,000th sermon that I had preached, and I used this same text. And I decided to use it tonight because my wife and I, when we were called to this church, we entered into a kind of a different and new ministry for us. So we're using this like a jumping off point for what we do. Um, the last time I was with you, I shared with you that I have a favorite Christian song, a song I love, I have loved for a long time. And it is my favorite Christian song, still is my favorite Christian song. And if you weren't here then, it was Jesus Freak by DC Talk. I love it. I genuinely love it. But I also like all kinds of music. So I have a song I want us to listen to tonight. Most of you probably have never heard of it. Many of you were, probably weren't even around when it was first introduced. It's kind of humorous and it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it has a good message. And, uh, I hope you enjoy it. It's a completely different type of music than we normally have here at Revolution. So if you like it, fantastic. If you don't like it, blame it on me. Don't take it to Moses because he didn't pick it out. I did. So Danielle, can we bring that song up? supply them in church you stay away when people come to know the lord the devil always loses so to keep them folks away from church he offers them excuses in the summer it's too hot and in the winter it's too cold in the springtime when the weather's just right you find someplace else to go well it's up to the mountains or down to the beach or to visit some old friend or just to stay home and kind of relax and hope some of the kin folks will start dropping in. Well, the church benches are too hard, and that choir sings way too loud. Boy, you know how nervous you get when you're sitting in a great big crowd. The doctor told you now you better watch them crowd. They'll set you back. But you go to that old ball game because you say it helps you to relax. Well, a headache Sunday morning and a backache Sunday night. But by work time Monday morning, you're feeling quite all right. While one of the children has a cold, pneumonia, do you suppose? Why the whole family had to stay home. Just to blow that poor kid's nose. Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. Now the devil is smiling, if church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, you say. He's too young, and maybe he's too old. The sermons, they're not hard enough, and maybe they're too bold. His voice is much too quiet. Like. Sometimes it gets too loud. He needs to have more dignity, or else he's way too proud. Well, the sermons, they're too long, and maybe they're too short. He ought to preach the word with dignity instead of stomp and snort. Well, that preacher we've got must be the world's most stuck-up man. Well, one of the ladies told me the other day. Well, he didn't even shake my hand. It's music, it's music, you'll hear them every day. Now the devil, he'll supply them if a church you stay away. 
When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Now, as we go through this message, you may say, why did he play that song? If you'll hang with us to the end. Maybe you'll find out, okay? We are in Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 22. And normally I read the entire text. But we're going to be reading through verse 33, and I'm kind of going to do it in sections today because I just felt led to do that way. Also, one of the other things is most of the time when you hear any messages from this pulpit, uh, it is from the New Living Translation of the Bible, which is fine. I've got a New Living Translation, and I like it. I've got several translations that I like, but as I said, this is kind of retro, and I'm old school, and I like the King James best, so I'm going to be using it. When you preach, you use whatever translation you want to use, okay? <laughs> so we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And realizing this is right after Jesus had fed the 5,000, I always think that's interesting because they talk, we talk about Jesus feeding the 5,000 with some fish and a few couple of loaves and but when you come down to it um, in Matthew 14 21 it says they had eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and children so we really don't know it might have been 5,000 it might have been 7,000 it might have been 70 we don't know but he fed a lot of people with a little bit how many know with Jesus a little equals a lot amen, amen. So all that has happened, and Jesus, straight away, verse 22, constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Kind of interesting to me. Jesus, Son of God, God-man. Jesus himself thought it was important enough to come apart from everything that was going on and go out to pray by himself. He decided that I need to go pray because of what is going on. Scripture's full of times that prayers were given up by Jesus, by his disciples. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says we are to pray unceasingly. What's that mean? Don't stop. Don't stop. Now, I think if you walk around all day and you're going, oh, Lord, take care of this, and Lord, watch that tree, and Lord, people are going to look at you strange, okay? So it doesn't, I don't think, mean to make a production of it, but always to be in the attitude of prayer. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus said that all men everywhere should pray continuously. So would you agree with me that prayer is important? Then would you also wonder with me why when we have Monday night prayer meetings, there's an awful lot of empty seats in this place? Hmm. Prayer is important, guys. I really, really encourage you to come on our Monday nights for prayer time. You know what? It's an hour apart from everything else. And if we will do that, imagine what God will do as we come together and pray as one united body of Christ. So Jesus is praying. He's put them in the boat, and he sent them across the sea. I wonder strange things sometimes, and I wonder as I look at that, how did they think he was going to join them on the other side? I don't know. I mean, was there another ship there? Was there another method? Was there a shorter way? I don't know. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a jet ski sitting there on the beach for him to ride over there. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. So Jesus sends him over, and he's, I just want you guys to get in the boat, go to the other side, and I'll meet you over there. So they began their journey. And bear in mind, these were fishermen. They'd been on this sea many times. 
many, many times. And they are rowing across the sea. And verse 24 says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed by the waves, and the wind was contrary. A couple of things I like about that verse. When it talks about in the midst of the sea, most of the things I could find and study about somewhere anywhere from one to three miles offshore. So they were out there a ways. And they're fighting this wind, which was contrary. I love that word, contrary. Have you ever dealt with a contrary situation? Yes. With a contrary person? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? What does it mean when you're dealing with something that's contrary? It's against you. Amen. I don't know who said that, but amen. It's against you. It's something that's coming against what you're trying to accomplish. If you are really trying to serve Jesus Christ, I promise you, you're going to come ac across some contrary situations, some things that are against what you're trying to do. So uh, the interesting thing to me was he puts them in the boat and he sends them out. Don't you know Jesus knew the wind was going to get rough? Don't you know Jesus knew that there were going to be waves? Jesus didn't tell them it's going to be like an idyllic canoe trip down some beautiful pond. He just get in the boat. And what did they do? They got in the boat. What should we do when Jesus tells us to do something? Do it. Do it. Amen. So he says, get in the boat and go, and the wind is contrary. You know, and the fact is, these guys knew how to deal with rough seas. They were fishermen. They'd been on that sea I don't know how many times. So they were dealing with something they knew how to deal with. And then it starts to get really good. Verse 25 says, in the, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. We read that kind of just without paying attention to it. Jesus came to him walking on the sea. You ever do that? Okay. Maybe when you were a kid, did you ever try it? Huh? Most of us did. You, you could think, think back when you were at the side of the pool or the dock or whatever, and you've heard about Jesus walking on the sea, and you're thinking, I, I could do that. I bet I could do that. You know, and you put one foot in the water, and you're, and you're going to stand really light. Because I've heard people say that before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit really light or stand. How do you do that? You weigh so much, you weigh what you weigh. So you put one, one foot in the water and you go, I think it's going to work. I think I can do that. And as soon as you take that other step, what happens? Boosh, you're under the water. Now, my old knees won't let me run anymore, but the way I would illustrate this second part is maybe you think, I wasn't fast enough. <laughs> if I get a good run at whatever I'm going to cross, maybe I'll be like that stone they skip across the water and I will give it a good shot, and maybe I can actually do this if I really run as fast as I possibly can. And you step off, and you make about one and a half steps, and you're in the drink again. When we talk about Jesus walking on the water, that to me is such an awesome, awesome vision. Can you imagine that? Now, this is the Bible study group that we deal with on Sunday night is coined a phrase. This is a J-ism. This isn't a scripture. But I believe that the winds were contrary and the waves were up. Kind of strikes me as, uh, have you ever been driving down 441 and go by Lake Eustace when the wind's really big and you see the white caps and everything? You don't see many boats out there. I have yet to see anybody walking around out there. So... As I look at that and I think, well, now, Jesus is walking on the water. Is he struggling? I don't think so. I really believe that every step Jesus took, everything got calm right in front of him. And he was strolling along, in the middle of the night, walking on the water. The disciples had never seen anything quite like this. They're out in, this, in, the, in the boat, in the uh, sea, and they are, the sea is terrible. And verse 26 says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. 
and they cried out for fear. You know, if you had been like my wife, Marty, who doesn't, who was afraid of water, she'd have been afraid a long time before that if the, if the seas were rough. They weren't dealing with fear in the, sea, in the rough seas, but some translations say they cried out for fear because it was a ghost. That's not something you see every day. Some guy comes stro strolling across the water, and they begin to, because they have the fear of the unknown. You have a fear of the unknown? Do you wonder about what might happen when the unexpected comes along? Another thing that was, I thought interesting about this, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 48, it said Jesus would have passed them by. If you don't believe it, check, check it out. I believe Jesus was walking along. The water in front of him is smooth. These guys are struggling. And really all he was going to do was go, hey, guys, see you on the other side, and walk, by the, and walk right by the boat. I believe that's what would happen. Mark's Gospel wouldn't have said that if, if that wasn't what was going to happen. So, he just is going to walk by them. And their fear of the unknown, they begin crying out. And Jesus says to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Cheer up. Church, let me challenge you for this. Cheer up when things look bad. Jesus is there. Cheer up when you're afraid. Jesus is there. Cheer up when that one thing that you think couldn't happen happens. Jesus is there. Most of us, when we hit those situations, the last thing we want to do is look at it cheerfully. You all are very quiet in here. That way, if if you can't go, if you can't utter an amen, at least go this. This means yes. Okay, so at least do that. We need to be the most fearless people that have ever walked on the face of the earth. Amen. Absolutely. What scared them? Not the natural that they understood. What scared them was the unnatural that they could not understand. I love Peter. Peter was pretty good about engaging his mouth before he did his, engaged his brain. <laughs> and so Peter answers him, and he says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. Now, there were a, a lot of other ways Peter could have found out it was for sure, for sure Jesus. But he asked him, what's Jesus going to answer? Lord, if it is you, what's Jesus going to say? It's me. He's not going to say, well, no, Peter, you're making a mistake. He says, Lord, if it is you, okay, it's me, Peter. Well, then tell me to get out of the boat and walk on the water. In the vernacular today, I wonder if Jesus wasn't saying, really? You really want to do that? Do you think you even can do that? But bless old Peter. So Jesus says, come. And this is so neat to me. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He actually walked on the water with the Lord. The impossible. Peter was doing the impossible. He's walking on the water. Now, I don't know how far he walked on the water. I don't know how long he stood on the water, but he did it. He absolutely walked on the water because Jesus said, you can get out of the boat and you can come to me. And he walked on the water. I just can't imagine what that must have felt like. Now, this is the part in, in this message most of the time that most people I've ever seen deal with it Say, and then Peter, as he got out in the water and he looked around and he saw, I think the way the word puts it is, he saw the, uh, the wind was contrary or the wind was, King James says, boisterous. He was afraid and beginning to sink. 
And most of the people I've heard preach this message go at this time, bad Peter, bad, bad Peter. You took your eyes off of Jesus and see what happened to you? Church, how many times do we do that with our fellow brothers and sisters? Oh, bad Christian. You took your eyes off of Jesus and look how bad things are for you now. Peter does the only thing he can do. He cries out, Lord, save me. Amen. Well, you missed a real good amen chance there. Lord, save me. How many times have we done that? How many times have we needed to do that? How many times haven't we done that when we should have done that? Lord, save me. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. So Jesus had a couple of things that he could have done. He could have ignored Peter. That would have been bad. He could have walked over to Peter grabbed him up by the back of the neck and drug him to the boat going, man, Peter, what in the world were you thinking? You're a bad, I don't understand. Get in the boat, Peter. Gone it. He could have done it that way. Could not have done it that way. But I like to think that what Jesus did was walk over and go, come on, Peter. Come here. Come on, Peter. Put your arm around me. Let me put my arm around you. Come on, it's going to be all right. Let's go back to the boat. Let's go back to the boat and, and get you back in the boat, Peter. Because I believe that's what Jesus would do. I believe he would have showed mercy and grace, and I believe he would have taken Peter back to the boat so, so gently. Now, he did rebuke him. Caught him by the hand, he said to him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Hmm. That is a hard word. You know that? Did you ever doubt? Did you ever come to the conclusion that, oh, man, this just can't be done. This can't be done. But, you know, Peter doubted, and it didn't work out the best like he exactly wanted it to. But you know what? In the very beginning, he had the faith to get out of the boat. Doubt is when we let our rationale take over our faith. That's what doubt's all about. When we go, well, how can that be? You know, the, the worst thing that you can think is going to happen to you, happen to you. And you go, well, Lord, how could that happen to me? And we begin to doubt whether Jesus really cares and really is capable Think about that when we let our rationalization take over our faith. Doesn't the word say if we had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, we could move a mountain? How many in here have seen a mustard seed? It's tiny. It's little. But God says if we had faith that size, we could move a mountain. When I think about that, I think, Lord, I haven't moved any mountains yet. How little is my, my faith, really? How little is my faith? What, Lord, what would it be like to have mountain-moving faith so we could do absolutely anything and everything in you? Peter looks at the circumstance instead of the person who is above the circumstance. One of my pet peeves and has been forever is when you go to ask your a brother and sister in Christ, somebody who says they're a Christ follower, they believe the word, they believe everything that Jesus said, and you walk up to them and you know things aren't really good with them, and you ask them, how you doing? And their answer is, well, I'm fine under the circumstances my response has been for years and why are you living under the circumstances I mean if you're living under the circumstances Jesus is above the circumstances why aren't you putting everything within with him 
the circumstance will fool you. The circumstance will absolutely get to you. So we need to figure out, guys, that Jesus is God above the circumstance. Amen. Jesus can do anything we need whenever we need it. It takes a couple of things. Faith and no doubt. Amen. You know, I just wonder what we would do if we would take a risk, risk to experience something totally awesome. That word awesome really gets to me in this day and age. I hear people say things like, that meal was awesome. Really? And what, oh, that was an awesome movie. Do you know what the definition of awesome really is? The, the use of awesome, the word really means to be frightened or to be completely moved, to be completely changed. I don't know, I've had some good meals in my life, but none of them were awesome. I've not been frightened by one yet, and none of them changed my life forever. But the experience Peter had was awesome. It was an experience that changed his life. I promise you that. It definitely changed his life. He's saying amen. Good job, Maverick. <laughs> and immediately Jesus stuck out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you have little faith. And then so, what, the next thing that happens is so neat. Jesus picks Peter up, and I've already shared with you, I think they gently return to the boat, Jesus being full of mercy and grace and love, and telling Peter, you could, if you'd have just hung in there, you could have done this. Put him in the boat, and the wind stops. Wow. That's pretty cool. Jesus got in the boat and the wind stopped. You know, there's another um, account of when they were in the sea and the wind was really rough, but it talks about being a storm, wind and rain. And the demeanor of Jesus always amazes me. Because the, the, the account I'm telling you about is over in Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 39, I believe. And, and the disciples are scared to death this time of the natural because the wind's so bad, the boat's going to sink. And what's Jesus doing? Sleeping. He's up in the front of the boat, sound asleep. Everything's good. All is well. And they get him up and say, Jesus, aren't you concerned? We're perishing. We're dying here. And Jesus, as only Jesus can, gets up and looks out at the wind and everything goes, peace, be still. Wow. What storm in your life is so bad that Jesus can't go to that storm and say, peace, be still? Is there any? Is there any? Is there a circumstance in your life that Jesus can't look at and say, peace, be still? I don't think so. I don't think so. And I guess I can give you a little personal testimony of that. Back in 2006, I got to experience uh, having a stroke and having open heart surgery. And I will tell you folks, I'm scared to death of surgery. I hate, I hate even the thought of surgery. And I was so concerned and worried and beside myself and the Lord gave me a scripture from Ezekiel about taking out the stone, the heart of stone, and replacing it with the heart of flesh. And all of a sudden, I knew it was going to be all right, because why Jesus was the Jesus above the circumstance. I knew everything was going to work out, because Jesus was in charge. 
I don't know how many of you have ever heard that testimony before or not, but just to show you how Jesus will work, I'm sitting in the doctor's office talking to him about the surgery, and I'm asking him questions, and he's asking me questions, and we're talking. And towards the end of the day, I went, well, I guess, doctor, I've done all the thing I need. I've talked to you about everything we need. I said, I guess we're done. And he said, no, we're not done. I said, really? I said, what do you need? He says, well, we have to pray. I don't want to do this without praying about it. Jesus is Jesus above the circumstance. The circumstance looked pretty dire to me right then. Jesus had it handled. Man. Amazing. Amazing. Verse 33 says that they were in the ship, and they were in the ship, came and worshipped him, saying of truth, Thou art the Son of God. Good confession. Good confession. So I want us to take a moment and visualize, if you will, with me, the shoreline where they all come to the, to the shore together and campfire, campfire over here on the shore. Thirteen guys sitting there. Eleven of them clustered together, fairly close. One kind of separated a little bit, another one kind of separated a little bit. So one of the guys that's a little separated is Jesus. Now, I don't pretend to know the thoughts of Jesus or the mind of Jesus. The Bible tells me that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8. But I kind of think in my mind's eye, my vision is Jesus is looking at the 11 and thinking, they got so much to learn. They've got so much maturing to do. I've got so much to teach them. I've got to watch them as help them build their faith. I've got to do what I've got to do so they'll know who I am. Did Jesus think that? I don't know, but I like to think maybe he had a mindset of something like that. Then the one other guy that was sitting a little bit apart would have been Peter. And I like to think Peter was thinking to himself, man, that was cool. I walked on the water. Wow. I got out of the boat, and I went to Jesus. And yeah, I, I kind of messed up, and it didn't work out. But I walked on the water. I was, I was out there, and I was standing on the water. Wow. That was so neat. Man. I have to think Peter was thinking that. And then there were 11 others sitting there that could only wonder what the experience of walking on the water could have been like. They sat there, and they looked at Peter and thought, probably some of them were thinking, man, that dude's crazy. I couldn't believe he got out of this boat. Some of them were thinking, well, I kind of wish I had that. I wonder, wonder what it felt like to walk on the water. Some of them may have said, boy, I'm just glad that night was over. That was a rough night. I'm really glad to be out of those waves and all of that. All of them probably had some kind of an excuse, and that brings me full circle. And the challenge tonight is, what is our excuse? Why do we not do what Jesus has called us to do? And there's a multitude of answers. Fear. Family, maybe, our vocation, the desire, the unbelief. We just don't believe Jesus can do it. I don't know what keeps any of us back from doing what we need to be doing. But I do know that there is a lot to be done. You know what the prayer request of Jesus is? Did you know the Bible contains a prayer request of Jesus Christ? And as far as I, I see a lot of prayers of Jesus in the Bible, and I see a lot of things that Jesus prayed for, but the one request I see multiple places in the Bible is that the fields are white unto harvest. 
pray the Lord of the harvest to send workers. That's a prayer request that Jesus gave to all of us. So the challenge is, guys, and you can already guess, you know what it is, right? Maybe it's time to get out of the boat. Maybe it's time to walk on the water a little bit. Maybe it's time to get above the circumstance. Maybe it's time to decide that thing that you really think you can't do. Yeah, you can. Maybe it's time to say, I'm going to put all my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to take the challenge that comes from doing that. Because that's a challenge. If you put all your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a huge challenge. Because let me share something with you. He's going to ask you to do something that's uncomfortable. He's going to ask you to do something you don't want to do. He's going to ask you to do something you don't think you can do. And when Jesus shows up the greatest is when we take the challenge of something that we know we cannot do and we succeed. And we succeed only because of the power and the glory and the help of Jesus Christ. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? Think about that. What would we do if we knew we could not fail? If we just decided, Jesus, you said this is what you wanted. I'm going to do it. And failure's not an option because you have got it all taken care of. You got the circumstance handled. You got everything taken care of. And let's just do it. So revolution, what would we do if we knew we could not fail? Hmm? Would we have five rev groups or 10 or 15 or 25? Would we have all the help we need in all the various parts of this ministry? Absolutely. Would the coffee bar be stocked with willing volunteers who are just laying, sitting there longing for someone to walk in so they could talk to Jesus, talk to Jesus about him? What would we do if we couldn't fail? Huh? We might even walk on the water a little ways. You know that? 